31 years after the Dark Portal, Garrosh's trial began in Pandaria. But apparently he wasn't allowed a fair trial because his crimes were indisputable, and that's how that works. So he didn't have a traditional defence. The only purpose of the trial really was to determine whether or not he should be executed. Tyrande Whisperwind argued in favour of the death penalty, whilst Bane Bloodhoof argued for imprisonment. The final sentence would be handed down by the August Celestials, with Taran Zhu overseeing the proceedings. Both the Horde and Alliance trusted them to lend an air of impartiality to the trial, despite the fact that Garrosh had completely desecrated their land and pissed all over their culture. Anyway, on the first day of the trial, members of the Bronze Dragonflight came forward to provide evidence. They channeled their energies through an artifact known as the Vision of Time, and conjured a bunch of past events, allowing everyone to quite clearly see Garrosh's crimes and the surrounding context. And yet, that seemingly ironclad evidence somehow managed to divide spectators. Yes, he'd done horrible things, but his motivations were open to interpretation. Plausible deniability never fails. The Bronze Dragons could not peer inside the former War Chief's mind. No one could know for certain what he was thinking nor could they confirm whether the Shah, Old Gods or other Void powers had influenced his actions in any way. The only thing that was certain was that Garrosh himself was confident that his invasion of Pandaria and his crimes against both factions would be justified in the end. Garrosh claimed that conquering Pandaria was necessary for the survival of his people. Allowing the Alliance to take control of the continent would have made the Horde's enemies unstoppable. His immediate show of force was only meant to deter the people of Pandaria from lending their might and resources to the other side. So, by the end of the first day, the Yoga Celestials still had no idea what kind of sentence Garrosh deserved. They did kind of accept, though, that he had motives beyond simple cruelty. If he were allowed to live, he might be able to learn from his errors and grow from them, redeem himself to become a worthy champion for Azeroth. That sentiment did not sit well with some other people, though. Sylvanas, for example, felt very strongly that the deposed war chief should not be allowed to live. During the war, Garrosh had treated the Forsaken as expendable, and also called her a bitch in 2010. Sylvanas felt that she was owed vengeance, and obviously had a few hang-ups about that sort of thing, so as far as she was concerned, if justice was not served to those whom Garrosh had wronged, then she would take matters into her own hands. Now, Garrosh's prison cell was guarded day and night, pretty heavily. However, Sylvanas' sister Verisa Windrunner happened to be a trusted member of the Alliance, and since her husband Ronin had been exploded at Theramore, she also wasn't Garrosh's biggest fan. She sent word to Sylvanas, summoning her to a super-secret meeting. They'd not spoken in years, but both agreed that Garrosh should die. Sylvanas would concoct a tasteless and untraceable poison, Verisa would sneak said poison into the former War Chief's food, and then the whole world would believe he died of natural causes whilst the two sisters would laugh to themselves about how they'd committed the perfect crime. However, as Farisa poisoned Garrosh's fruit, she got the cold feet. She confessed her intentions to Anduin Rin, something the young prince himself kind of struggled with for a moment, very nearly just allowing the poisoned fruit to be served to Garrosh anyway. But, in the end, Anduin stepped up, informing the former war chief that his food had been tainted, saving the bastard's life in the process. Now this may have been the morally right thing to do, but, in hindsight, maybe wasn't the best decision. Because unbeknownst to everyone involved in that, some other people were plotting to undermine the trial. Firstly, Rathian, who believed Garrosh was much more valuable outside of jail rather than in one. The Orc had a knack for quickly accumulating power, resources and allies, all of which were needed in the coming fight against the Burning Legion. And secondly, a bronze dragon called Kairos Dormu, this bloke had fashioned the Vision of Time himself, and was secretly sympathetic to the ideals of the Infinite Dragonflight, questioning the value of the true timeline. He was also aware of the coming of the Legion, and recognised in Garrosh a valuable commander, one that could save Azeroth, provided he had the freedom and resources to do so, both of which Kairos could provide. So when the trial next resumed, Rathian's bodyguards burst in out of nowhere, Garrosh's own loyalists saw an opportunity and got involved, and in that chaos, Kairos went ahead and helped the deposed war chief escape through a portal. Now, the August Celestials weren't actually that troubled by Garrosh's escape, revealing that they'd kind of decided he was going to live anyway. However, the leaders of the Horde and Alliance were not quite so nonchalant about it. They vowed to hunt him down, wherever he was. 
unaware that that was going to be a little bit more difficult to achieve than they could possibly imagine, because Garrosh wasn't on Azeroth anymore. He wasn't even in the same timeline anymore. And thus begins the Warlords of Draenor stuff. Everyone's favourite expansion. The portal through which Kairos and Garrosh escaped took them to a world that was nearly identical to the Orcs' homeworld of Draenor. T'was the past, an alternate Draenor, that had not yet fallen completely into the hands of the Burning Legion. Its Orcs were uncorrupted. Garrosh immediately turned to Kairos and demanded an explanation, and the Bronze Dragon revealed that he'd brought the Orc here to find allies for the coming battle against the Legion. The plan was to recruit Orcs from alternate realities creating an army vast enough to drive the demons back. Garrosh's knowledge of the Horde's advanced weaponry would allow the Orcs of this world to be equipped with stuff that was decades ahead of their time. And then, using a shard from the Vision of Time that Kairos had brought with him, they could return to Azeroth, unite the world behind his leadership, and destroy any who stood in his way. And then visit even more timelines and realities, forming an infinite number of Hordes with unrivaled power. Garrosh could see that this plan was absolutely brilliant, but refused to be anyone else's subordinate. So, he asked Kairos if he could see the shard from the Vision of Time for a moment. The Bronze Dragon handed it to him, and then he just straight up murdered the bloke. He then looted Kairos for the rest of his stuff, and set out across the lush open meadows of Nagrand, arriving at an orcish village a short while later and immediately meeting his own father, Gromash Hellscream. Now Garrosh had only ever known his father as a fearsome war chief, but this alternate version of him was slightly less impressive. He had attained the title of Chieftain in the Warsong clan, but was still very much a novice commander. However, Garrosh still saw an opportunity. He went ahead and told Gromash a tale of Dranor's future, how a traitorous warlock called Gul'dan would fool the orcs into following the Legion, how Gromash would be the first to step forward and drink the corrupting blood of Manoroth, and how after seeing the power he gave him, others would follow, ultimately dooming the planet. What he didn't tell his father though, absolutely intentionally, was the stuff that came after that. He then asked Gromash to help him unite the Orcs under one banner. With the weaponry Garrosh could offer, the other clans would most definitely submit. Once united, they would march against Gul'dan and the Legion, and save their world. And Gromash replied with, maybe prove everything you're saying to me right now because I'm not just going to take your word for it. So, Garrosh used the shard from the Vision of Time to prove his words. He took his father to the Stones of Prophecy, and in this sacred place, Grom witnessed the Orcs' future, right up until the end of the Second War with the internment camps and stuff, at which point Garrosh knocked the shard out of his father's hands like, oops! And obviously not at all wary of how suspicious that was, Grom then agreed to join Garrosh's cause. It was time to form a new, tougher and more powerful than ever before thing, and call it the Iron Horde. So, Garrosh and his father set out to get right on that. With the aid of the Blackrock clan, they built a foundry, to forge superior weaponry, and then marched across Draenor to slowly but surely recruit the rest of the clans. Word was then sent from Gul'dan and his Shadow Council, requesting all orcs gather in Tanan jungle, where they would all receive a super awesome gift. So they did. But Gul'dan was very surprised when Gromash screamed a command at the last minute, and the gathered orcs suddenly revealed they were fully geared with future tech. The Warlock and his Shadow Council were quickly captured, with the Pit Lord Manoroth being struck down with an axe to the face. And simple as that, the Orcs had successfully staved off the Legion. Gul'dan and his peeps were the demon's only connection to Draenor, so as long as they remained in confinement, the planet would be safe. But Garrosh didn't give a shit about Draenor. All he cared about was his wounded pride, making sure the leaders who had once imprisoned him were forced to kneel at his feet. And since his father was now indebted to him, he could get started on that real plan. So. Garrosh went ahead and described another promising future to Gromash, one in which his father led the orcs to conquer all who would not bow before their kind, starting of course with a place called Azeroth, a bountiful world which could provide resources and stuff. Gromash then ordered the Iron Horde to begin constructing a new dark portal, and once that was done, they used the power of Gul'dan and his warlocks to open the gateway. Then, Garrosh selected an elite vanguard of orcs to enter said gateway, known as the Iron March, and they emerged in Azeroth's blasted lands. It was obvious they were going to need a little bit of assistance initially, just to hold their footing on Azeroth, so word was sent to Warlord Zayla of the Dragonmoor Orcs, and she accepted, leading her forces to join with the Iron Horde. They then all made their way to Blackrock Spire, establishing their first proper base, and during that, 
Garrosh also sent four loyal goblins of the Black Fuse Company, who helped the Iron Horde to innovate further weaponry. This obviously drew some attention from the Alliance authorities in the region, so they dispatched some champions to investigate. These Alliance heroes did manage to clear the Iron March and Dragonmoor from Black Rock Spire, eventually, but not without heavy losses. It was clear that this new enemy was strong, too strong for the Alliance to handle on their own. And so, a council of leaders from both Horde and Alliance convened to discuss their options. Thanks to intelligence gathering, they had established that this Iron Horde was the work of Garrosh Hellscream, and that was enough for them to decide to form a joint coalition. First, their combined forces would push the Iron Horde back through the Dark Portal, then a smaller strike force would pursue the Orcs through the Gateway and deal with whatever the hell was waiting for them on the other side. So they went ahead and did that. The smaller strike force consisting of Thrall, Khadgar, a Draenei Vindicator called Murad, the Night Elf Cordana Felsong, Blood Elf Lady Liadrin, and every single person that was playing World of Warcraft in 2014. Arriving in Tanan Jungle, their first objective was to close the Dark Portal. Yes, that would mean that they were trapped on Draenor, but at least Azeroth would be safe. Heroes from the Alliance and Horde quickly isolated the portal's source of power, Warlocks, Gul'dan's Shadow Council. So, whilst desperately fighting through the Iron Horde's relentless onslaught, they freed said Warlocks, only for them to immediately escape, which is probably nothing to worry about, right? But despite that little faux pas, the Dark Portal was indeed closed. But with that dealt with, the Strike Force's objective turned to that of survival. They faced a dangerous journey through a hostile land so they were going to need to make some friends. Fortunately for them, as they fled through the jungle, they found some friends. A whole bunch of peeps that were being held prisoner by the Iron Horde. But even with those peeps, they were still vastly outnumbered. The Iron Horde were hot on their heels, so the decision was made to split up. They could cover more ground if they went their separate ways. A brash Frostwolf Orc named Ganar, as well as a Shaman called Drek'thar agreed to lead the Horde champions northwest to Frostfire Ridge whilst the Alliance champions would head south to Shadowmoon Valley, accompanied by a young Draenei priestess called Yurel, who also just so happened to be Prophet Velen's apprentice. And with that, the two armies parted ways, determined to gather enough resources and allies to find and defeat Garrosh once and for all. As a little side note, Gromash and Garrosh were not the only folks that the heroes of Azeroth would need to contend with in this expansion. The Iron Horde had some legendary champions of their own, with Gromash directing the entirety of the Iron Horde, Garrosh was made leader of the Warsong Clan. Kilrog Deadeye led the Bleeding Hollow. Kargath Bladefist had his army of Shattered Hand Orcs. Nazul was in charge of the Shadowmoon Clan. And the last of Gromash's allies was Warlord Blackhand of the Black Rocks. So quite a lot of storylines to get through. But anyway, Alliance stuff comes first in the book. The Draenei were once known as the Eridar, living on a planet called Argus. And life was great until the day Sargeras arrived. He appeared, all innocent and godlike to them, offering power and knowledge, not mentioning the hidden cost that they'd all be transformed into demonic creatures. Two of the planet's leaders, Archimonde and Kil'jaeden, were fooled by this offer, whereas the third, Velen, was not. Velen was granted a vision by a Naru, a being of pure holy light, and in it, he saw the truth of the Legion's plot. So, he and his followers decided to cheese it. Boarding a mighty dimensional vessel called the Genadar, which was powered by three Naru, and off they buggered, travelling the cosmos for eons, before eventually they crash landed on a different planet, Dranor. This group of Eridar then started calling themselves Dranai, which in their language means exiled ones. They built a bunch of holy temples around a region called Shadowmoon Valley, and then just kind of prospered there for a bit. They had the occasional tension with the local orcs, but other than that, everything was fine. Until it wasn't. Anyway, the Alliance Force and Yurel arrived in the Draenei lands and started to build a garrison, but the valley's native Shadowmoon orcs then launched a major assault on a nearby Draenei village, the village of Vimbari. And whilst the heroes managed to end that quickly enough, Yurel's sister Samara was taken. Yurel was pretty upset about that, so the Alliance forces assured her they would find Samara, and immediately got to work organising the Draenei forces for a counterattack. Meanwhile, Nazul returned to the Shadowmoon village of Shazgul with his prisoners, and he was absolutely terrified. Though he'd managed to thin the Draenei's numbers, that was not the clear-cut victory the Warchief had demanded, and Gromash did not suffer weakness or failure. Nazul was going to need to crush the Draenei soon, or else he was probably going to lose his head. He needed a definitive strike 
that would fracture the people and their hope in one fell swoop. And what better way to do that than to target their most sacred site, Karabor. But Karabor was well defended with advanced Dranai weaponry, and Azul had not exactly been provided with the best resources from his warchief, so he turned his sights to the powers of the Void. See, the journey across the cosmos and the whole crashing into the planet thing had weakened the Naru, accompanying Velen and his peeps. The weaker they got, the more their radiant holy energies started to dim, and in the absence of light, unholy void energies started to form. One of the Naru, named Kara, had accumulated so much void energy that it begged Velen to eject it from the vessel, far enough away so that it could do no harm, and Velen, with a heavy heart, went ahead and did that, leaving Kara floating in the upper atmosphere, drifting aimlessly across the sky above Shadowmoon Valley, where its body continued to accumulate void energy. Over time, the Shadow Moon Orcs of the region had grown accustomed to its presence, dubbing it the Dark Star because they had no idea what it was. But Nazal did know that with enough unholy energy, he could summon that star down to Dranor's surface, destroying the Dranai Temple City and anyone who lived there. And he also knew that the gathering of such a large amount of void energy would require sacrifices. So he went ahead and ordered his warriors to take the Dranai captives to the Anguish Fortress. There he would ritually slaughter them all, and offer their blood to bring down the Dark Star. So that was his plan. Back with the good guys, still pretty hellbent on rescuing her sister and the rest of the captives, Yurel volunteered to take a group of Rangari, Dranai scouts, on a sneaky mission. Velen gave his blessing, so she marched her allies across the valley to Shazgul, and whilst Yurel and her allies searched the village, the Alliance heroes set explosives to create a distraction for their escape. However, Whilst executing their separate objectives, Yurel's party was set upon by orcs. The Rangari quickly hid the priestess, allowing her to overhear that the captives had already been relocated to be sacrificed. But by the time the Alliance champions arrived, Yurel was alone, devastated, having witnessed the death of every single Rangari accompanying her. The young priestess grappled with doubt in herself and her leadership. But after a little pep talk, she rallied finding the courage to keep fighting for her sister. After escaping Shazgul, the Alliance found a new, unlikely ally, Rul Khan, former elder of the Shadowmoon clan and wife of Nazul. She disagreed with her husband's use of forbidden magics, even if he was only doing it due to pressure from the Iron Horde. So she gave the Alliance champions her keystone, which allowed them to enter Anguish Fortress. Alongside Velen and Jurel, they raced to the altar at the top where Nizul and Gromash were discussing their dark plot to destroy Karabor. Unfortunately, they arrived a little bit too late. Both Grom and Nizul departed through a portal, and Jurel surged forward to find her sister bleeding out atop the altar, beyond saving. It was probably this moment where Jurel kind of snapped a little bit in her mind. But due to all the sacrifices, the Dark Star was now beginning its descent from the sky. Defeat seemed all but inevitable. But... As Velen silently watched the creature that had once been a saviour to his people, now slowly fall from the sky to become their doom, he realised something. The energies of the Dark Star could be nullified by an equal amount of holy light energy. And there was really only one source of light capable of generating such power. Him. So, without hesitation, he made his decision, passing his Naru sigil to Yurel and sacrificing himself. Which was sad, for a few seconds before you realise this is alternate Velen, so who gives a shit? Velen's physical form dissipated, becoming a big old beam of light. That beam then collided with the void creature in the sky, and boof, all was right in the world. Velen's light did such a good job that Kara, the lost Naru, actually re-emerged, floating in the sky as a beacon of hope amid the recent darkness that engulfed the Dranai people. But whilst the Dranai all cheered and celebrated the survival of Karabor, Nazul was not happy, obviously. After a failure that disgraceful, the Shadow Moon Chieftain knew he was on borrowed time. So in a last ditch effort, he ordered the full force of the Iron Fleet, which had now amassed in the harbour, to invade the city. And that actually worked. The defence crystal securing Karabor was destroyed, and the place was quickly overrun. Yurel and the champions made their way to the fallen city as quickly as they could. The bulk of the Dranai forces were pinned down inside, but the Alliance's garrison had rallied outside the Temple City. And backed by the recently revived Kara, and its incredible holy light, they cut a path through their foes and crushed the invading forces. Mazul and his orcs retreated to their last remaining refuge, 
some ancestral burial grounds, but ultimately the Elder Shaman and his followers were defeated. And that's that for the Alliance Shadowmoon Valley stuff. Meanwhile, Horde stuff. The Horde peeps made a turbulent journey to Frostfire Ridge. Each of the Horde champions suffered in their own way, but none carried a greater burden than Thrall. Prior to the destruction of Draenor in our reality, Thrall's family had led the Frostwolf clan, with both his father and grandfather serving as chieftain. Thrall had never known his family. Both of his parents had been assassinated by the Shadow Council when he was just a baby. After being found by a human and raised as a slave, Thrall had escaped and reconnected with the Frostwolf clan on Azeroth for a bit. And during that time, he'd heard all sorts of stories of his family's heroism. So ever since, his heart had burned with an impossible desire to know the parents who had been so cruelly taken from him. He hadn't revealed this to anyone yet, but the orc that was guiding them up the mountain, Gnar, was actually his uncle. And if this bloke was still alive, then perhaps the rest of his family were also still knocking about. Soon enough, upon arriving at the remote village of Wargol, Thrall was indeed reunited with a version of his parents, Draka and Duratan. They led survivors in a resistance effort against their Iron Horde oppressors, which mostly consisted of Thunderlord Orcs and a bunch of Ogres. However, they weren't doing so well. Gromash had given the other clans of Frostfire Ridge everything they needed to conquer the Frostwolves. It was only a matter of time before they fell to an enemy with near bottomless resources. Now, the Thunderlords were led by the Iron Wolf, a brutal chieftain who'd conquered much of the region already. In the earliest days of the conflict, the Iron Wolf had slain Garad, who was the chieftain of the Frostwolves at the time, and also Thrall's grandfather. Garad had three sons, Fenris, Gnar, and Duritan. Fenris was the eldest son, and therefore would have been the first in line for leadership, but an ideological dispute between him and his father had caused the bloke to abandon the clan long ago. Whereas Garad valued the lives of his people above all else, Fenris was obsessed with combat and felt that their focus should be on destroying their enemies, even if it costed lives. And that whole argument resulted in a Mac Gorar between father and son, which Garad won. He spared Fenris's life, but in doing so, kind of shamed him. So Fenris buggered off, and no one knew where he was. Even the death of his father had done nothing to bring him back to the clan. Gnar, the middle child, was one of the prisoners we'd rescued in Tanan jungle. This was the first time he'd been back in Frostfire Ridge since the skirmish in which his father was killed, so obviously he couldn't have been selected as the new chieftain because he wasn't here. So that had just left Duratan, Thrall's father, the youngest son. And being the youngest, he was struggling with the responsibilities that had been thrust upon him. His clan were basically facing impossible odds, so you can't really blame the guy for having a little bit of imposter syndrome. However, Thrall and his Horde compatriots knew exactly how to counter the weaponry and tactics of the Iron Horde. With their aid, the Frostwolves now had a glimpse of hope. A well-fortified garrison was then constructed to run operations in the region, and whilst that was being built, Thrall spent a bit of time getting to know his old man, whilst keeping the fact that he was his son a secret. He knew the Duratan of this world was not his actual father. Having that conversation would only distract from their shared mission. Anyway, at some point, Gnar rode off with a contingent of Frostwolves to assault the Bladespire Citadel, against Duratan's wishes. The Bladespire Ogres had been the ones who carted Gnar off to the Iron Horde's prison camps, so he was a little bit blinded by vengeance, and also blinded by being the middle child and therefore really insecure. So, Horde champions and Duratan pursued the idiot, ultimately helping him to take the Ogre stronghold and kill their king, Gorthog, and capitalised even further on that attack by rescuing a bunch of Frostwolf prisoners in the mines beneath the citadel as well. So that worked out well, in the end. But whilst the Frostwolves and the Horde all celebrated that incredible victory, Gnar just buggered off again with another raiding party. Unfortunately, Thunderlord spies had caught wind of the intention to attack Blades by a citadel, and rather than run to the aid of their ogre allies, the Iron Wolf ordered his people to march on Wargol instead, catching the village at its weakest moment. Draco managed to hold off the attackers long enough for the Horde reinforcements to come back, so it wasn't a complete disaster, but noticeably absent from the defence of the village was Gnar, who was still off on his mad quest for vengeance. So once Wargol was secured, Juritan asked the Horde champions to track his brother down. So they did. They found him in the depths of Dagamore Ravine, having just killed one of the Iron Wolf's sons, and then accompanied him whilst he murdered the rest of the Iron Wolf's kids. However, 
Even that did not satisfy his need for vengeance. Gunnar agreed to return to Wargol, but upon arrival, invoked his right as the elder brother and challenged Duratan to Mac Gorar. Whoever wins takes leadership of the clan. Gunnar claimed that Bladespire Citadel and his success against the Iron Wolf's sons were proof that his methods were superior. He could no longer be party to his brother's weak leadership. However, rather than respond to the challenge with direct violence, Duratan threw down his weapon and refused to fight. But he did tell his brother exactly what he thought of him. You have repeatedly abandoned your people to serve your selfish need for vengeance, you twat. If Gunnar was so desperate for leadership of the clan, then he would have to strike down his brother and see who followed him afterwards. And that actually worked. Gunnar was still angry, but he saw wisdom in his brother's words. Only together could they defeat the Iron Wolf. So now that all of that dick-waving stupidity was out of the way, the Frostwolves and Horde heroes rode for the Thunderlord village of Gromgar. As Gunnar and Juritan challenged the Thunderlord chieftain, the bloke went ahead and did a Star Wars, revealing his true identity. The Iron Wolf was Fenris, their long lost brother. Many years ago, he joined the Thunderlord clan and worked his way up to the position of chieftain, the whole time believing that one day, his new clan would reap the fruits of the Frostwolves' softness and weak leadership. Fenris and his weird two-headed flying pet thing then attacked, but thanks to the Horde champions that battle was over in one sentence. And with Fenris's defeat, the war between the Frostwolves and Thunderlords came to an end. However, they didn't get a chance to celebrate that because Gromash Hellscream's Iron Horde then marched upon Frostfire Ridge. Hell bent on restoring order and retaking any ground that had been lost. But Draka had a plan. The Iron Horde had no choice but to march their army through Thunder Pass, which would serve as a perfect choke point. When the attackers arrived, Drakthar could call upon the elements to collapse the pass and bury the invading army. But calling that kind of elemental power was going to take some time. So the Frostwolves were going to need to enter the pass, engage with the invaders and hold them back, long enough for the Elder Shaman to complete his magic. They tried to do that, but unfortunately the Iron Horde forces were a little bit too strong, so holding them back didn't go so well. Juratan gave the command to retreat, with the intention of staying behind with Gunnar, sacrificing themselves to buy that final little bit of time that Drakthar needed. But at the last moment, Gunnar urged his brother to safety, making it clear that Juratan was indispensable to the future of the Frostwolves, and that he'd been wrong to ever doubt him. Draka then held Juratan back, preventing him from stopping his brother from making the ultimate sacrifice, so all he could do was watch as his brother rushed headlong into the enemy lines fighting till his last breath so that Drakthar could complete his ritual. And that was that. A massive avalanche then fell atop the encroaching Iron Horde army, and all was right in the world. Obviously Juratan was a little bit upset, but this was just the start of the Warlords of Draenor expansion. Gromash was now on the back foot, so the Frostwolves needed to go on the offensive. They needed to ride east, out of the Frostfire Ridge and into Gorgrond. Juratan hoped that there, in the Iron Horde's centre of manufacturing, they could execute a series of counterattacks. If the Blackrock clan fell, then Gromash and his allies would be left all but defenceless. 